What are they, everybody? How's everyone doing? Good, awesome. Hey, what does it mean to have the joy of the Lord this morning? Joy of the Lord is which is the gladness of the heart coming from knowing God, abiding in Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to stand to our feet. We've got a bit of a song. And so if you want to come up and get a shaker, the shakers are just not for the kids, whanau. So you, you come get you a shaker and you shake that thing. Um, you want to come get some ribbons, you come get a ribbon. You just wave that thing everywhere. You go crazy. And so uh, we're going to get up and we're going to do a little bit of a uh, kid song. And then, yeah, and then we'll get into it. Come grab a shaker. Let's go. Stand to your feet, guys. How many people realize how unfit they are? Me, right here. Uh, we're going to do a minute to mingle, so why don't you get up out of your seat, go meet somebody, someone you haven't known as well. And as we're doing the minute to mingle as well, we're going to release our kids. Our beautiful kids can go out now as well. Okay, so we continue on our series of Blessed Are the Peacemakers, and we're going to go into a time of worship through communion and through giving. And so I'm just going to be praying over our tithing and our communion this morning. Um, and so let's do that as we enter into this time of worship, song. Uh, Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your life, Lord. We thank you so much for your death but we praise you for your resurrection, Lord. Father, as we enter into this time of, of communion, Lord, we remember your body that was broken, your blood that was poured out for us, Lord. 
We thank you so much for making a way, Lord, that even when we were so deep in our sin, you made a way. You know our past, our present, and our future. And you say, come to me, my son. Come to me, my daughter. I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And so wherever we are at right now, Lord, we come to you with everything that we have, everything that we are, Lord. And we know because in your Bible it says that you leave the 99 to save the one, Lord. And so, Father, as we take our tithing as well, Lord, as we take the seed, Lord, and we plant it, Lord, back into what you were doing, Lord, back into your kingdom, back into your hands, Lord, let this be a heart posture of worship to you, Lord, knowing that everything in our life, including our income, including our money, is yours, Lord. We are so grateful. And so, Father, as we enter into this time of worship through song, through communion, through giving, Lord, let us posture our hearts before you, knowing that you are the giver the sustainer of everything, Lord. That everything comes from you. And so we stand in awe of you. Our hearts postured towards you. And we want to give it back to you, Lord. And so allow this time, Lord, to do a work in our hearts. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come right now. We invite your Spirit here, Lord. We say, have your way this morning. We thank you so much for the work that your spirit has been doing leading up to this time right here, Lord. But we say, come, Father. So just in your own time, communion stations at the front and the back. Um, but yeah, let this be a time of you and God connecting with God. So let's do that. us to worship through this song that we're going to do next. Just singing out of what those beautiful words that Jacob's encouraged us in. What God's been doing in our hearts as we're prepared to come this morning. Or what he's been doing just as Jacob has um, reminded us and been praying to bring our worship now together as God's people.
praise, Lord, we pray that you would feel welcome in our praises, Lord, that this wouldn't just be songs that we're singing, Lord, but the words that we sing would connect with our hearts. We stand before you completely known. Lord, you know us from the day that we were born. You know our thoughts, you know our desires. You know our griefs and you know our celebrations. And so, Lord, we bring that all to you this morning. We thank you that you are our God, the God that knows us and the God that loves us. And we say we are your people. And we glorify you this morning as the one and only God.
was reminded of Acts 2.36 as we were singing that lyric. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It's a beautiful name. It's not, he is not just another Jesus, but he's Lord and Christ. He is God. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you through music and song. Thank you for the effect that it has on us when we do that, when we declare truth in music and song. We pray that you would receive our worship, that you would be glorified through our worship to you. Father, this morning I want to pray for Toronga Elam. Would you uh, just continue to draw near to them? Would you be their strength? Would you help them to preserve the unity that they have that came at great price? I pray that you would protect them, that you would provide for them, and that the witness that they are in the city and beyond here in Aotearoa would just bring glory to your name. Strengthen them, Lord. I pray that through the testimony of many that call Taronga Elam their home, that people would come to know you that they'd humble themselves before you, that they would experience the love and forgiveness and restoration that comes through being in relationship with you. We thank you and give you praise. Amen. All right, grab a seat. Thank you, team. Hey, I consider it a real privilege to be teaching in this mini-series. Blessed are the peacemakers. To share with you my struggles, my failures, my victories is humbling, really is humbling. To share with you what I've learned through the pastoral transformation course, through counseling, through reading, through studying the scriptures, and through Uh, listening to other people on the subject of how to resolve conflict and restore relationships. This that I'm in, that we're in, has been incredibly helpful to me. So thank you for allowing me to share those things that I have learned and I'm learning. Not only that, but thank you for leaning in. So many conversations this week have been people sharing with me about how they have felt prompted by God to go and seek to resolve conflict and restore relationships. And so so it's encouraging for me. It's like, oh, we are being a people that is not just hearing the word of God, but we're leaning in and we're seeking to do the will of God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. This next slide is part of the definition that we have. It's still on the wall out in the, in the foyer and around the place, but I want to take us back here and just remind us of this. Through hospitable, unhurried time together, particularly around food and fun, I always love that, this unified yet diverse community displays radical love, acceptance, and respect for one another Real, authentic, vulnerable relationships create an environment of honest and open communication where the truth is spoken in love, forgiveness is frequent, and encouragement is constant. It's right where we are now, church. It's right where we're at. Things are getting real. I think we're moving out of an authentic community into authentic community. So where have we been in the last couple of weeks? Uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't been able to uh, be here or to watch, you can go to YouTube and just search Lifestone Church and you can come up with the last two messages. It would be good for you, all of us to watch those. Except it's really hard for me to watch me. <laughs> Anyone ever had to do that? It's so strange. But we started off in week one, we were saying, in conflict and seeking to resolve conflict and wanting to restore relationships, I make the first move. And then we moved on and we kind of said, while we're making that first move, we need to ask God for wisdom. 
Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I'm really scared right now. This is awkward. This is difficult. So help me, Lord, and help me now. (laughs) We need to ask God for wisdom. And then where we landed last week was number three. We begin with what's my fault. I've discovered I can find something that was my mistake, even in my poor response in the conflict, maybe even my defensiveness in the conflict, but begin with what is my fault. And instead of accusing and instead of excusing myself, instead of attacking and instead of blaming other people, I've learned to look at what is going on inside of me. I kind of, I need to say that when I say I've learned, I'm learning. Yeah? I'm learning. I don't think that this is the kind of thing where you flick a switch and the next day you're 100%. God might grant that to us sometimes, but I'm learning. I've learned and I'm learning. But the first cause of conflict is self-centeredness. It's about what is going on inside of me. And last Sunday I said, Lord willing, I want to unpack the two causes of conflict. Lord willing. Hey, Lord willing, we're here. Isn't it good? Breath in the lungs, blood in the veins. Come on. It's good, right? It's good to be here. And so last Sunday I said I want an opportunity to unpack these two things a little bit more. You see, self-centeredness, when I want what I want, how I want it, and when I want it, and when somebody else wants what they want, when they want it, how they want it, they bump up against each other and we got a problem. There's conflict. There's tension. And so James chapter 4 verse 1 says this, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? The conflict... The fights and quarrels among us, the conflict that I have with other people is coming from within inside me. When I'm at peace inside, what's outside doesn't upset me. When I'm at peace inside, what's outside doesn't upset me. Now, it doesn't mean I agree with everything that I see or hear. There is a lot that I disagree with. It doesn't upset me, though, when I have peace in here. It doesn't mean that I don't think that there's things that need to be changed. There's lots of things that need to be changed around me and in my relationships. But it just means I don't get distressed. I don't get distressed by what's going on around me when I have peace in me. I can disagree without being distressed. I'm learning that I can disagree without being disagreeable. Personally, I don't find it easy. Some of you uh, might go, oh yeah, that's, I get that. For me, I find it really hard. I'm challenged by it. but it's what is going on inside of me. If I'm filled with peace, almost nothing upsets me. If I'm filled with love, almost nothing irritates me. If I'm filled with Jesus, almost nothing winds me up and ticks me off. On the other hand, if I'm filled with ego and pride, and self-centeredness, anything can wind me up and tick me off. Anything can make me mad. Anything can irritate me. You can do the smallest of things, and if I'm full of myself, you can hurt my feelings really, really quickly. And so it all depends what's going on inside of me. What's going on inside of me? And I'd love to unpack what I've been learning about our emotional, my emotional reservoir and 
maybe the Lord will grant that to us another time. But when my life is empty in a whole lot of areas, emotionally, there's a saying that I've learned, when the river, the river of resili- resilience, when the river runs low, the rocks begin to show. And so I, when I'm not in an emotional good place, it's kind of dangerous. And you might want to write this down. It is always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than dissolve a relationship. It is always more rewarding to dissolve, resolve a conflict than dissolve a relationship. Resolving conflict is hard work. It takes two people being committed to work. It takes bucket loads of grace and patience and kindness, but is always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than dissolve a relationship. You know, it's my nature to be self-centered and it's my nature to be stubborn. And if I'm going to have good relationships, if I'm going to have good friendships at work uh, with a client or in my marriage with my kids, I have to start thinking less about me and more about the other, more about them. And so the first cause of conflict the Bible makes, the Bible says it's really clear that it's self-centeredness, that it is selfishness. And the second is pride. The second cause of conflict is pride. In pride, I'm stubborn, and in pride, I get my feelings hurt easily. Humble people don't get their feelings hurt easily. Proud people do. They get their feelings hurt all the time. And so when my ego gets wounded, then we have a conflict. Look at this verse up on the screen here. It says, pride leads to conflict. Where does pride lead to? Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Some translations read this way. Pride only leads to arguments. Leads to arguments. I've had to learn, and I'm still learning, to approach conflict with a humble heart and to begin with what is my fault. What's my fault in this conflict, in this tension? And then number four, I listen for their hurt and perspective. It's really important to listen for hurt because there is always hurt in conflict. We think that we argue over ideas, but we actually argue over emotion, we argue over feelings more than ideas. Any time there is a conflict, someone has had their feelings hurt. Someone has felt abused. Someone has felt slighted. Someone has felt there is some kind of injustice. And it's not the idea that causes conflict. It's emotion. It's the emotion behind the ideas. The emotion that's there. You may have heard that hurt people hurt people. How many people have heard that? Don't be shy. We're far no. Hurt people hurt people. In other words, the more that I am hurting, the more I will lash out with the people that are around me. People that are not hurting don't hurt others. There's also a saying that healed people heal people, but hurt people hurt people. People who are filled with love are loving to others. People who are filled with joy are joyful to others. People who are filled with peace are at peace with everyone around them. But if I'm hurting inside, I'm going to hurt. And the more that I am hurting, the more that I will hurt. Hurt people hurt people. And that principle is true in every sphere, every dimension of life, whether it's in Parliament, you know, I'm kind of up to speed with the conflict that's going on in Parliament at the moment, 
hurt people hurting people. It's, it's true in parliament. It's true in the marketplace. It's true in marriage. It's true in Ukraine. When people feel that their dignity is destroyed and when people feel that they are not being listened to, that they're not being paid attention to, that they're not being valued, people will get mad. It's like getting a cat and pushing the cat in the corner. When you push the cat in the corner, it's going to take a swipe, right? And so we need to listen for their hurt and their perspective. You know, if I want to connect with people, I've had to learn to start by listening to their needs, their hurts, and their interests. Now, I have to say, again, another tough lesson for me. But what they need is for me to listen to the hurt, listen to their needs, listen to their interests. I think it's tough for me because for 50-something plus years, I've been listening, and I relate. And I'm like, oh, yeah, back in 1990, this happened to me. And then the whole conversation transitions off the person with hurt onto me. It's totally unhelpful. Totally unhelpful. So I need to listen to their hurt, and I'm learning to listen behind the words. There's stuff behind the words, right? There's emotion behind the words. It's not just what they are saying in a conflict. I need to listen to the emotion behind the words. It's far more important to do that. It's so important. Because people will say one thing, but they're actually feeling another thing. Even in casual conversation, you can say, how you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm getting there. And if you dig, yeah, I'm fine. I'm getting there. Can sometimes mean I'm not fine and I feel like I'm not getting there. James 1.19 says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be, what? Quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. Now, if I do the first two, the third happens automatically. I do the first two, the third happens automatically. However, if I'm not quick to listen, and if I'm not slow to speak, we can be like a trigger-type anger or defensive. A better way to say it is that when I'm quick to speak and slow to listen, that's when I get angry, when I'm quick to speak and slow to listen. God has given us two ears and one mouth, and I'm learning... I need to listen twice as much as I speak. Hard for a preacher, eh? In the second block of the pastoral transformation course, May of this year, I learned, Steve, slow down the intellectual processing. And like I just said, for 50-something years... I've been listening to respond, to bring a solution, to give a right answer. And Richard Black's like, Steve, slow down the intellectual processing. My head's going really fast, like much faster than it's really fast. It's in triple turbo mode. And so it's like slow that intellectual processing down and listen. And I'm beginning to understand the difference between the right answer and the real answer. This is the next step in conflict management. I really need to listen to their hurt and listen to their perspective because I don't know their perspective until I've listened to them. I don't know their perspective. I can think I know. I I can. I, I can. My mind can do all kinds of things. And think, oh, yeah, I know. I've got it sorted. That intellectual processing has taken me to a place that might actually not be true, might not be real. And so always listen before speaking. This is such a key to diffusing conflict. I listen before I speak, and then people feel validated. These two things on our cranium, they're actually love organs. 
because people will feel loved when they're listened to. The eyes are the same. People will feel loved when you're paying attention to them. When you're not looking behind them, when you're not glancing at your device, how I'm really interested in your pain, but wait, I've had 55 likes on my Instagram. So the eyes are also love organs. Always listen before speaking. Philippians 2, 4 and 5 says this, each of you should look. And maybe if you're old school and you've got a paper version, you might want to highlight look, you might want to put a circle around it, underline it, whatever, but I'm going to come back to that. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. What God is saying is Steve, intentionally switch your focus off you onto the other person's needs. Conflict resolution starts with the way that you look at the situation, the way that you see it. The word look there, that says look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The word there is a Greek word called skopos. And skopos is, isn't that cool? Skopos. Maybe we should say it like we're really learned. Scopos. But the word scopos there, it means, it's where we get the word microscope. It's to look at little things that we don't normally see. It means to telescope, where we also get that. You look at the stars that you can't normally see far off, up close. You, scopos means to focus, focus, focus. And so the verse says that your attitude, my attitude, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I am most like Jesus when I am focused on the needs of other people, on the hurt that somebody else is experiencing rather than my own. I am most like Jesus when I'm focusing on the hurts of somebody else, my child, my wife, my co-worker, my mum, someone in my connect group. When I focus on someone else's hurts instead of my own, that is when I am most like Jesus. Do you realize that when Jesus was on the cross, dying for all humanity, he was not focused on the pain that he was experiencing. He was focused on me. He was focused on you. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Scopos, focused on the others. First focus on their perspective. How do you do that? By paying attention. You may have heard this again. Seek to understand before before seeking to be understood. That's what Jesus is saying here in this verse. See, I can be so busy trying to get the person I'm in conflict with to see my position, to see my hurt, to see my injustice and not listen to theirs. I can get so busy doing all of that that I don't get their perspective and I don't hear their pain. And when that happens, people do this. They move further and further and further apart. And so I listen for their hurt and their perspective and it will bring us together. So we're recapping. We make the first move. I ask God for wisdom. I begin with what's my fault. I listen for their hurt and their perspective. And then I speak the truth tactfully. All of these points are easy, right? You can laugh. I'm like, oh, man. The truth sets us free. But I need to say the truth in love. I need to say the truth with kindness I need to say the truth with tact. People say, well, you know what? I'm just a straight shooter. I'm from the hip and I tell them how it is. Truth bomb. Nah, that's just pride. It's just being rude. It's being inconsiderate of somebody else. And I don't want to be that person. I want to shoot from the hip and tell it how it is. 
When you're like that, you just got something in your head, something in your life, and you just want to get it out. That's not listening for someone's perspective. Ephesians 4.15 says this, Instead, we will speak the truth in... We'll speak the truth in... We'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. The truth is not enough. It's not just what we say, but it's how we say it. Anyone that had a mum that said that to them? Oh, man, I'm the only... Thanks, mum. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. You're having a rumble with your sibling. And you know what? If I say it offensively, it will be received defensively. If I say it offensively, it will be received defensively. Always speak the truth in love. I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. Boom. This is... I never get my point across by being cross. I wish I could have owned that about... 21 years ago before we had kids. I never get my point across by being cross. I can't use truth as a club. People change faster and people change easier when truth is wrapped in love. It's often difficult to receive the truth, so let's wrap truth in love. And I, I, It's not easy, church got something to say that needs to be said and it's like man how do I how do I say this in love so we've got to pray and ask God for wisdom right people change faster and people change easier when truth is wrapped in love I learned earlier this year this saying I kind of feel like the last two years has been learning sayings but empathy before education Empathy before education. Truth without love is resisted. Truth with love is received. So it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. You know, over 12 months ago, um, Kelly and I took a phone call from an amazing couple. And they asked us to come and meet them in a cafe for coffee. And they sat there with us and with great tact, with tenderness, with kindness, they brought truth to us wrapped in love. And I feel so indebted to that couple. We heard what they brought. We took on what they brought. But it's such a good model, the way they just went about that whole, I don't know, scenario. It was beautiful when I'm just in awe of, of what God did in us and in them as they brought, brought to us truth and love. So much respect. Proverbs 12, 18 says this, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In a conflict, foolish words hurt and wise words heal. Ephesians 4:19 says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Some translations read, do not use harmful words, but only helpful words. I'm going to wrap up. Make the first move. Ask God for wisdom. Begin with what's my fault. Listen for their hurt and perspective and speak the truth tactfully. God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called the children of God. Father, thank you that you made the first move. You left all that you knew and took on the form of a human you took on flesh and you restored us to yourself by giving your life. 
Thank you that in the pain and the suffering and the mockery and the hurt, you stayed scopos, you stayed focused on us. Lord, I, we don't deserve it, but we receive your salvation. We thank you for Holy Spirit living in us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for relationship with each other, that we can do that because we were restored to you. Thank you that we're restored to ourselves because of you. So thank you for seeing our hurt, for seeing our pain. Thank you for removing the barrier between us that we might be called the sons and daughters of God. You're so kind. You're so powerful. You're so gracious. You're so merciful. You're just and you're holy. You're present. You're unchanging. And we know you. We love you. We serve you. We're in relationship with you. And so thank you, Lord. I pray that we would be characterized by, as people who work for peace. More than peace talkers, more than peace wishers, more than peace hopers, but that we would work, that we would labor with your strength, with your wisdom to be peacemakers. And through it all, we long that you would be glorified. We long that people would look on and see you at work in a community of people that are real and authentic. And that it would draw people to yourself, that people would humble themselves before you, confess their sin, that people would say yes and amen to your love and to your promises to salvation and forgiveness. Help us, Lord. Help me. Help us to step into the hard places. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you so much that you are good, that you rose from the dead. We thank you so much that you are in this, Lord. Just like Exodus, Lord. When Moses said, I don't want to move, Lord, until your spirit goes with us. And so, Father, we don't want to move right now. We don't want to be anywhere unless your spirit is there with us, Lord. And we thank you so much that you died on the cross. You sent your spirit as a gift. Beautiful is your name. Can we just sing um, what a beautiful name it is?
Yes, Lord, we thank you so much for the power of your name. The name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you so much for the work of restoration that you're doing in this place, Lord. We thank you so much for the work of reconciliation that you're doing in this place. We thank you so much for the work that you are doing within our own hearts individually, but also with each other as well, Lord. We know that this is impossible by ourselves, Lord. But we thank you so much for your spirit and your word, Lord, that is alive and active. And so, Father, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We worship you this morning, Lord. And so this morning, whatever has rested on our hearts, whatever you have prompted, whatever you have nudged us, whatever you have revealed, Lord, that may seem a little bit uncomfy, I pray, Father, that we would embrace that, knowing, okay, Lord, this is a journey that you have me on. I trust you in that. And so, Lord, lead us. We need you. Fill us. We need you. Guide us. We need you. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much, worship team, as well. Um, we got some sausages on the go. You probably can smell it. Can you smell it? If you haven't smelt it yet, maybe just go, go do a big. Uh, and so we got some sausages on the go. Coffee is there as well. My beautiful wife is on the coffee, so you know it's going to be good. Hey, hun. <laughs> and so let's enjoy company together. Let's enjoy each other's community. Um, don't forget your kids. Oh, man, why do I keep saying that? I can just stop saying that. Um, enjoy your kids. Is that what I should say? Enjoy your kids. Um, but yeah, enjoy our time together. Meet someone new. Who haven't you met? Let's see. Oh, I wonder if I can go introduce myself to them. Buy them a coffee or go and get them a sausage. So look for Jesus, share his love. Hi, thanks for watching online. It's so good to have you with us. If you need help, specific prayer for anything, feel free to comment in the section below. Otherwise, during the week, give our church office a ring. Or even better, come down and join us. Come down to Seven Oak Lane. We'd love to have you join our service. We want you to know that God knows you. He loves you and he cares for you. So this week, we pray that you might know his love and his resurrection power in a new and wonderful way. Thanks for watching.